My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to another episode of How to Disaster, a podcast to help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. In 2017, in the North Bay of uh, San Francisco North Bay, we experienced this massive mega fire, and it was um, devastating. We lost over 6,000 units of housing overnight in one night in a four county region. And one of the areas that was most devastated is this small hamlet in Sonoma Valley where I live called Glen Ellen. In Glen Ellen, um, a large percentage of the homes were destroyed and there it wasn't, it's not a very big place anyway. It's mostly famous because uh, it is where Jack London made his home and where you may have heard of Jack London State Park. It's a heavily wooded area and it was full of a lot of people who'd actually been there for even generations. And then it also had this uh, parallel issue of many homes that were vacant, which in the past decade had been purchased as second homes. Um, Margie Foster, who is on our podcast today, and she'll tell you more about herself, she uh, led this heroic effort. She's probably going to give credit to everybody else, but the effort was, how do we actually rehome the hundreds and hundreds of families who have lost their houses here in Glen Ellen, here in Sonoma Valley? And they started doing person-to-person -person rehousing. Uh, it may sound like an obvious thing to do. Um, it may seem like maybe, you know, that's you know, just what happens. But one of the things that we want you to know in this podcast is that so much of the recovery, the rebuilding and the reimagining begins with you. It begins with the, um, the citizen. It begins, it begins with emergent leaders who say, you know what, I see a need here and I know that I can actually um, improve the situation and lessen human suffering if I'm able to solve this one corner, this one piece of the puzzle. Well, Margie Foster, I, I worked for the county at the time that we had these uh, disaster, this, this particular disaster. And um, I got a lot of calls from her. I had a lot of conversations with her because we were getting calls from people who had been burned out of their homes and they were looking for emergency housing or even long-term housing. Well, uh, Margie and a few people from her community got together and they did whatever they could. They found vacation homes. Um, they pulled um, RVs onto their homes and onto their lots, maybe where there used to be houses for up to a year or more. So I invited Margie on this podcast today to talk about what inspired her to do this and the logistics of it, because we are called How To Disaster, and we do want you to know that there are pathways forward. There are systems that have been done before that are not prescriptive. They are adaptive. And maybe there's a few things in her strategies um, of success that you can actually use um, for your own disaster. So I really want to welcome to the podcast, Margie Foster, and thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, Margie Foster, you are here with us and we just had a pre-conversation where you uh, express that you are unsure if you have something to offer. And I'm going to jump on that first because uh, I think that um, one of the most important things that this podcast could possibly do is to show people that everyone has a role to play and emergent leadership is so incredibly valuable and important. So I welcome you to this podcast and I'm also you. inviting you to tell us your story and, and then we're gonna take it from there. So welcome Margie. Thank you. Um, I'm just such a behind the scenes person. I'm not in the leadership uh, position, but I do like to take charge of things that I can help with. So, but I'm, I'm behind the scenes. So this is not all that comfortable for me. Uh, you know, I'll tell you that uh, for me, it's also been a very uh, uncomfortable learning experience because I certainly was not jumping in front of any cameras before COVID. And uh, so I totally get it. But this is why I think that people like you are really the secret sauce in recovering from disaster. You're not in it to be a hero. You're actually doing the heroics. So yeah. if you can, would you please take us back to the night of October 
um, 8, 2017. And tell us your fire story before we get started on how you stepped up to help your community. Well, following a very lovely Glen Ellen Village Fair day, um, we all went home and it, it, it got windy, but you know, it gets windy here and acorns were falling on the roof and everything seemed fine. We had no in, inclination of what was coming, but around, I think around one or 1.30 in the morning, we started hearing sirens. And we thought, oh, a tree's down on Warm Springs or Bennett Valley. And, and then we thought we heard, you know, fire engines going to cut down the trees. My husband was a volunteer firefighter. So it wasn't unusual after a windy uh, evening to uh, hear sirens, but they kept coming. And then we heard, I believe it was a sheriff or a deputy with a loudspeaker saying evacuate now. So like everyone else, there was no warning of anything. We grabbed our animals and got out of the house within about 10 minutes, not knowing which way to go. So it's the same story as everyone else. Confusion, there were fires along our route. Uh, some uh, power lines were down and sparking and uh, it was terrifying. But we got out and evacuated and of course didn't know if we were evacuated about two weeks and didn't really know for sure if our house survived. Um, but we, we eventually had friends that stayed within the fire area and rode their bikes around and told us it had, but until you drive up and, and see your home still standing, you know, that was a wonderful feeling, but very cheerful getting to our home because the fire came within six houses of ours. And, uh, we're driving through a neighborhood where houses are gone and we knew the people that lived there, they were our neighbors. So it was, uh, it was a difficult time. It was really a, a stunning thing to see too, because um, especially if you're driving up Warm Springs, you get to the beginning of O'Donnell Road. Um, yeah. if you, people have, you know, people who do wind and rain events in particular, you know, they're used to seeing like a certain type of destruction. But until you see what a wildfire does, a mega fire, it's so stunning because it looks, it can look completely normal. And then all of a sudden it's like just a bomb. It looks like a bomb went off or, um, you know, it can be miles, it can be yards, it can be feet, but you know, that's what it looked like was that a bomb had gone off. There was um, a worker who came to our area. I can't remember, he was reinstalling PG&E or lighting people's uh, uh, meters. And uh, he said he had just come back from uh, Afghanistan and said it looked similar to that, like a bomb had gone off. It looked like a war zone. And it was so sad. And, and I know what you mean about the devastation of a fire, because we survived a disaster. We actually lost our house um, after the floods of 1986 here in Glen Ellen. And we didn't have, uh, we didn't get flooded, but we had a landslide under our house and it left, it left us perched in midair with no land under it, under us. So, um, but that was not as devastating as a fire. We lost our house, that was devastating, but we were able to get our belongings out and um, the, the fire was a different kind of savage devastation, total, uh, so. It, but we it, understand losing your home too. It's always awful to lose your home. And, you know, we're certainly not in a competition for any kind of disaster, but I do think it's important for those who are unfamiliar with what a fire disaster looks like. It's, you know, three inches of oily ash is what's yeah. left. And your chimney and your gas line, you know, with usually with a flame. It's very eerie in this way. So very yeah. eerie. Yeah, very eerie. So tell us, uh, can you describe Glen Ellen? Um, because we expect that there will be people in very rural communities, suburban communities, cities that listen to this podcast. And, um, and, and we'll be like, well, what did that, what was that community like? And how can I take some of these lessons um, from this podcast? So can you describe Glen Ellen for us? Well, we're a very tight knit community. We've been here about 45 years. And uh, you just know everybody in the community, especially if you're involved in it, which my husband and I have been. 
and we lost about 25% of our homes. So that's one in every four families that has lost their home. And um, it was very emotional. You'd go to the store and the first thing you would say was, did you survive? Are you okay? Um, and some weren't and lots of tears were shed at the wow. post office, at the store, is it? Yeah, for, for months, that went on for months. And I think people have to know, have to expect that it will go on for months and it's, and to uh, yes. maintain compassion. And we like to remind people because we work with newly fire affected communities to say mm -hmm. that, you know, the person in front of you is often undergoing a uh, trauma at the same time as, you know, it's the trauma of fleeing the fire. And then it's often the trauma of what they've lost along the way. And right. to remember that, because it can be hard sometimes to keep ourselves in order and to keep our compassion, you know, going and going and going for such a long period of time. It could go on for years. Right now, three years after the fire, when we hear fire engines, more than one, many neighbors go out and we watch the road. It, it's, it's still there, um, especially if you hear lots of fire engines. We're all going on our phones to Pulse Point or Broadcastify to find out. It, it, it hasn't left us after three years even. So it, it is a very long process. It really is. Um, and also we've had the unfortunate experience of having other mega fires, most recently the glass fire, which came into Sonoma Valley, not into Glen Ellen, but was certainly uh, terrifying for many of us who experienced the first round of this sort of devastation because it actually burned into the burn scar of our 2017 fires. So mm -hmm. you talked about a tool there though that I wanna go back to, which is um, on your phones, if your cellular phone is working, um, what have you done? Um, did you have Pulse Point before 2017? Did you have Nixle alerts? What did you have in the way to actually notify you of a, of a disaster or the need to evacuate? Nothing. No, we'd never heard of Nixle. Um, we'd never had a fire you know, really. Um, so we were not prepared other than that, that uh, deputy going by saying evacuate now. We, none of us had any clues, nor did, nor did the fire department. So everything came, it was such a weird event. Everyone says never seen anything like that. First, this kind of event. So no, we were not prepared. And it took us about a year, less than a year later, I became a, uh, a, a captain of a neighborhood group. We, my neighbor and I initiated a group and we, uh, we canvassed the area from the end of one fire zone up to a manageable, we, we uh, canvassed 32 properties and 24, which is 74% responded, yes, they would like to join our group. And so we've created a phone tree and we actually, we've used it a few times just to check on people when it was windy or really rainy or for the glass fire. So um, we've instituted that and we have Nixle and my neighbor was in former uh, law enforcement. So she has scanners and she's really hooked up to all that. And, but I, I couldn't take all that was too much for me, but I do pulse point. And so I think everyone should find what they're comfortable with, but be notified if they happen to have a smartphone and if not to, to get in touch with someone who does to let them know we need to we need to make connections and watch out for our neighbors and our community and so it's also important to note that you have more than one system to notify you in case of a disaster so you have you're using nixel which will yep. notify you but you're not depending on that you're also looking at pulse point say that if you get a notification from nixel you can always check pulse point because it'll tell you if it's a medical or fire emergency in your area right and then broadcastify will actually allow you it's like a scanner on your phone for and um, to hear you know what is going on across those public channels public safety officers just so that people are aware um, that it is good to have a multitude of systems we also recommend that you have a, a fire, a, sorry, a, an all weather radio that doesn't depend on, that's either a crank or that you have um, batteries that are readily available to put it in there. Right. And it, yeah. And so do you have a go bag? 
Yeah, I have all my emergency contacts in it that because I'm a captain of a group, that's real important. So it's in with my cat carrier because I knew I would get the cat carrier. And um, yeah, we have a go bag kind of loosely, you know, we were real into it in the beginning, but we, meds, animals, deeds, yeah, I, I have a list and we've given it to our emergency group, but I, I haven't done the best that I could do, but I, I we will be fine. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. So, you know, um, I actually in the intro, I explained that one of the reasons why I really wanted you to come here is because I do, I do really believe in your emergent leadership and the compassion that was shown and the real change um, for the positive that you and a couple of people made in the rehousing of people locally. Now, let's be clear, um, that's not always possible post-disaster. There are and, you know, many instances, especially with wildfires, where there, there just isn't the housing to do that. And you have to depend upon FEMA trailers. And there is a time and a place for that. But right. sometimes in some communities, there are opportunities um, to rehouse people. And I believe it was called like keep them in Glen Ellen and then it became keep them in Sonoma Valley. Can you talk to us about um, who you were doing that with, how you set up a system and um, just like all the hard work that you put into um, really trying to keep people who had lost everything close to home? Well, we went rogue. <laughs> we, um... While we were evacuated within about three or four days, uh, I told my husband, we need to find some used trailers and get them on our property. We knew they would be needed. Um, but our, our prior disaster helped educate us to that because when we lost our house in 86, our kids were two and five. We knew we had to stay in the community. We wanted to stay in the community. So we bought a, an old, trailer, a one little one bedroom trailer and put it on our property so that we could stay in our community because that was of the utmost importance to us for the kids to have a normalcy and for us to be in our community. So after the fires, we thought that's what we need to do. That's what we can do right away. So with it, before we even got back to our property, we had purchased two used trailers and we weren't equipped for that. So, but our goal was to get somebody in there by uh, Thanksgiving. So my husband worked 40 to 50 hours a day, rented, oh. rented tractors, clearing, leveling, making places for two. Uh, we dug up our lawn. We put a trailer where one of our lawns had been and created another area. And then we had to get an electrician out to uh, get, so they could be wired. One had an uh, EV, an electric vehicle. So um, at the time we didn't know who was gonna be moving in there. We just knew someone would need it. So we set up uh, two trailer areas. And I have to say we didn't get permits or anything because we were working so hard to get the places ready that we just did it, but we did it right. We had an electrician come in and, and set that up right. We, we uh, purchased uh, septic tank type things and, and, arrange, and we got propane out to both of them and we arranged for a septic company. So we did all that by Thanksgiving. And um, so we just sort of took it upon ourselves to get it done. And by the time we got everybody in and went back to apply for a permit, they weren't doing it anymore. So we just thought, We'll take our chances. So that may not be the right way to do it, but that's the way we did it. Well, if you can go rogue, you're kind of going to have to in a disaster. Um, right. and as long as you, you know you keep health and safety and your community at the at the at the uh, forefront of what you're doing, and you you did take you still took care of the environment um, right. while taking care of your community. So you went rogue, but it, you really went rogue responsibly, and I think that that's really an important. Um, distinction. And during this time, the County of Sonoma did um, change an ordinance to allow people to actually have uh, RVs on their property or on the street for a, up to six months at that point. And then I think they extended it another six months, as long as they had septic or a contract with a, um, a company that would come and pump out these sewage. 
So you went yeah. rogue, but it wasn't like we did. Crazy. No, we we followed everything and we looked at the county's guidelines and we did everything, but we just couldn't find the time to do that. And the folks ended up being here two and a half years. That's how long it took them to rebuild. So they just, yeah, it took two and a half years. So um, the six month thing we knew wouldn't work, um, but none of us thought it would be two and a half years, but yeah, we were happy. We were so happy to be able to help them. Was Arthur Dawson one of the people who ended up yeah. on your car? Oh, well, yeah. you know, what, I mean, what a community treasure. I cannot imagine Glen Ellen use, you know, losing a person like Arthur Dawson because he is a, he's a historian. He's right. like an ecological historian and he's very much somebody who always gives back to the community. So by doing this thing and by extending your compassion for so long, you actually helped your community retain what I would consider a gem and a right. very important person, you know, to have. Yeah. So um, we and they, and they they had a dog and two cats. So even finding a rental would have been extremely hard, but we didn't know they were going to end up in our trailer. We just did it because we knew someone was going to need it. And Nick Brown is in the other one, and he's active in the community as well, neither of which we knew very well. Um, we knew Arthur because he worked in the schools when our kids were there. And uh, But I didn't know Nick at all, but they were community people, and it was important to keep them in our community. And I think one of the lessons that I um, that I really took from the 2017 fires, and certainly part of that was inspired by your actions, was um, you know despite what's happening during COVID, which is a little bit different. Um, normally, what happens in a disaster is um, a community does not start to hoard and turn away, and, you know, pick up guns and start shooting each other for food. That's not how it really works. Right. What normally happens is that the best of humanity meets the moment and we turn towards each other. And I would like to continue to advocate for that approach. And I love the fact that you were, you didn't have an agenda for who might go in there. You were like, we just know that this is absolutely needed and that we have the ability to provide it and we're going to do that. So I applaud you and your husband for doing that. Thank you. <laughs> So can you talk to us though about um, keep them in Glen Ellen and then keep them in Sonoma Valley? Because I know that I got calls from you um, when I worked with a supervisor saying, you know, here's what we're doing. Or I was able to connect with you for a woman and her family who had lost their home. They ultimately ended up moving to a different area of the county. Um, but you did manage to do, to pull off this really remarkable community led uh, rehousing. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. Um, I think I helped place either 13 or 15 people just because I'm, I'm a visible community person and so people trusted me. Um, and a friend of mine, Ed Davis, started a Facebook group for people who needed homes and people who had homes to share or to rent. So he started that and uh, there was a lot of give and take on that. People were finding homes, but um, there were a few that just couldn't because they couldn't afford Glen Ellen prices. And um, we were able to help a family personally, a family of five to keep their kids in school locally, um, found them a place below market. Um, and, and it's just that we know a lot of people. So someone said, I, I, have, I have a cottage, but I don't want just anybody. So um, if I, I went to Ed and he gave me information on some people and if, if they knew, if we knew them or they knew somebody, people felt a little more comfortable, not just putting it out to the universe, but wanting to know someone that, that could verify for them or vouch for them or refer them. So um, it's just knowing a lot of people and being connected to your community. And, and Ed had that great Facebook group. So that that gave us all a vehicle to, to help find people places. And social media plays a huge role in emergent leadership too. I think that's remarkable. And I know that I don't think any of us ever, and we, we used Facebook, sure, before 2017, but I remember this moment looking at my Facebook in the first 24 hours and realizing that I had to open it up to fully public in order to get this done. And it really did, it really does, 
actually work beautifully in a disaster. Where it goes wrong is when people post hysteria, non-expert opinions. And right. um, in one case, there was a woman in Glen Ellen who didn't actually live there, but was posting from San Francisco incorrect information about when you could get back in and then paying to promote it for days when it was not only outdated, it was never true in the first place, prompting the sheriff to actually have, have to issue a statement. So I don't know if you remember that, but there no. can be a downside. Well, you know, when we're offline, I will tell you her name and you will be like, oh, of course, but you know, so there are, there, sometimes it can be a, a negative, but it can just be a huge positive as well. I want to go back to something that you said just a few minutes ago about um, how to, I think one of the, you know, one of the things about a resilient community is in fact a connected community. And I just interviewed some people from BKs, which is off the um, coast of Puerto Rico a couple of weeks ago. Wonderful podcast. And one of the things that was really important is that when um, one of the people had to choose somebody to sort of lead an effort or put um, over half a million dollars into their uh, care, as it were, in order to help the community, they chose somebody who is not in the field of disaster. They had to choose them based upon their ethics and knowing that they were good people and that they knew enough people to make um, a difference. Can you talk to us about that and how you made a difference because you knew so many people or some of the activities that you had done prior to the disaster that really ended up helping because you were so connected to the community? Hmm. Well, we we were in, my husband and I were both well known in the Dunbar school community, as as were many of our friends. It was such a vibrant community, but we were volunteers, got volunteer of the year, as did many of our friends. And so that was a great way to connect. We're still connected with all those school friends 30 years later. But I also uh I'm a bookkeeper, so I had I was a treasurer for um gosh, friends of Glen Ellen in the late 70s, early 80s. And then, so you meet people outside of the school community and then the Glen Ellen Association, uh, which was a precursor and actually started the Glen Ellen Village Fair. And then, um, so with my skills, I was able to be part of all of these groups. And, um, and then the Glen Ellen Forum which also was very important after the disaster. Uh, they, they, uh, th you just become well known in the community, and then people and well trust trusted you. though too. It's it's right. you have yes yes people trust you and uh, even though I'm not a big horn tutor, I like to work behind the scenes. But um, you get to know people. You've been somewhere 45 years and you're involved in the community. So so people. Uh, did trust me actually a few friends from back east uh sent me a thousand dollars knowing that i would be able to uh get it where it needed to go because they didn't have any connection here but they wanted to help after the fires that happened a few times and then you just made sure the money went they wanted it to go to somebody specific and uh, we did that you did some individual assistance then with that with that money. Is that how you chose it? Uh, well, the the Glen Ellen Forum got it. We got quite a few grants. Uh, in fact, uh, we got. I mean, I wrote I wrote all those down because we did a sheds program. Well, you have yeah. a. I think you have two grants from Rebuild North Bay. Too. We do. Mm -hmm. We got two. Well, we we started getting one initially from the United. United Way Wine Country. And one of the things that funded was a community meal, which was really important. Uh, it was in November, I believe. And we got a great outpouring of people. We gave a free community uh, meal down in downtown Glen Ellen and fed hundreds and hundreds. And there were many tears and many hugs and a lot of gratitude uh, and uh, so that was a wonderful thing. And then we also got funds for uh, sheds to purchase sheds for uh, some of the fire ravaged properties because it's really sad, but people who owned those properties had come and collected a teacup or a grandmother's spoon or something from the ashes and set it aside and they, things were went missing. 
and that was just horrible insult to injury. So uh, the forum applied for and got a, a grant for some sheds, but the need for sheds was so much. We were only able to give as much as the money covered the first, uh, the first round, but I was determined that everybody on the list would get one. And we only initially uh, had enough for about 10 or 13, but then we applied for more grants and Rebuild North Bay gave us two um, in, in alternating years because we also did a landscape program where people could get a gift certificate to get something green on their property. I mean, there were, there were lots that were just blackened, nothing was left there. So even if you could get one tree or some planting, so we did that, but we got, um, we got enough money to buy 33 sheds and 27 gift certificates to fire survivors. Uh, Rebuild North Bay gave us two grants, the Beltane uh, Wine Club, their wine club members gathered money together and gave us several thousand. The Glen Ellen uh, Kenwood Rotary gave us funds for sheds and United Way. So a lot of people helped, helped in that uh, regard. So what I'd like to hear from a citizen's perspective is what was the first year like in the post-disaster uh, recovery and rebuild? What did you see your community go through? And what were a couple of things that really worked to either hasten it or lessen the sort of agony and grief? I would say in Glen Ellen, very little happened in the first year. It was very frustrating. We were one of the last communities to get to rebuild. In fact, there are still homes being rebuilt th almost three years later. So there was a lot of frustration. Uh, everyone thought they might be in their house after the first year, but after the first year, very few were even started. So um, it was frustrating for the first two years. In into the second year, we started noticing houses going up, but um, it was frustration uh, in the first year a lot of it because people weren't getting their houses built. Contractors were already were already doing other things and uh, prepping the land because it had been badly damaged um, by the mitigation of of the cleanup. Um, a lot of people had to get soil to rebuild. It was just it was a problem and and it was very slow for Glen Ellen, but. But well, let's talk about that for a minute because that's another thing that people um, who, who, who live in like wind and rain areas, they don't necessarily understand that when a wildfire comes through, it actually will destroy the infrastructure of the house all the way through to the foundation and below. Right. So that means that your water systems, your wells, your septic tanks, those are destroyed. Um, you cannot use, for the most part, you cannot reuse your foundation. So that right. is also destroyed. And because we hadn't really seen a fire of this magnitude before, there was a lot of miscommunication at the top about how far they should be scraping down because they scrape everything off your property. Um, what could be left behind, what could be reused, like retaining walls um, can often be reused, but not always. It really depends on what an engineer says, but just the mitigation of the ground and what's on the ground was in many ways, um, we, we, we cleaned up quickly and under a year, but mistakes were made, including over scraping of the, um, of the lots because there was a, a mandate from one part of the government saying that it had to be, you had to scrape all the way down until you found a, a certain level where there, was, where there were no chemicals, but then they came back later and, um, and changed that ruling. So, there was some confusion because people had never really been through this before and there was definitely some over scraping and so that too that's when you when you're talking about the people had to bring in soil some of those mitigations especially in the heavily rural areas were very difficult to overcome yeah we we have several friends and neighbors that experienced that and i think uh after the glass fires we actually lost uh our family cabins in kenwood uh, this last fire, four of them from the early 1900s, full of history, but um, they, they, they're doing it different now. They said they learned a lot from the 2017 fires of not, not to over scrape, not to go down as deep, what, what could be saved, but 
most people originally thought, well, we'll just do the same footprint, we'll save the foundation, but that didn't work out. So you, you just need to be patient and know that they're learning as they go. They've learned a lot since 2017. And, um, well, they too are learning how to disaster, but from a very different perspective. So, right. but it's also just a good thing for other communities to know that if you do have an unprecedented event in your community, there isn't a sector that's going to get it right the first time out. It's, it's, so it's incredibly important that we actually share our lessons. And one of those is, is that in the first year, we often expect a lot of um, progress. And the first year is really about getting clean so that you can rebuild. And that can be a very frustrating. So Margie, we have about 10 minutes left of our podcast. And I'm wondering what are like the top five things uh, you would like to impart upon newly disaster affected communities or people who are wanting to somehow be prepared? I don't know if that's really entirely possible. Should this occur in their own community? Well, if you go to the pre fire preparedness website, you, you get a lot of information and you should go because you go, oh, that I'll, re I'll think, remember that. But having a plan of where to go and, and not everybody has more than one road to get out, um, like Oakmont and, and we, we here in Glen Ellen don't have too many roads out, but um, just know your exit strategy and know where you're going to meet up and um the, wh one of the big things and i wrote it down because i wanted to say it uh, you you had asked how do you disaster and the big thing is don't expect to do it yourself um you have to get help people will offer and people should offer to help even bringing you meals because there's so much paperwork to go through when we lost our house back in 86, everyone wanted to know, how can I help you? And uh, they brought us meals. We, we said, oh no, we don't need help. We'll, we have to figure it out, but everybody needs to eat. So that's one thing people can do to help other friends who've gone through a disaster, but don't expect to go through it yourself. Ask for help. People will want to help, ask for it. And then when you get through your disaster, pay it forward to other people who will be in situations where they need help. Well, I can't think of a better place to stop because, you know, we have a whole program called pay it forward. Um, huh. I just, I, I firmly believe in that we are currently working in Southern Oregon and in Santa Cruz. Um, we uh, work with paradise for, we still actually, I'm on the phone with paradise still like many days a week, but they don't need my help. He's just like my, best friend colleague now at this point um, and worked with Malibu. And um, so much of that though was inspired by what we saw here, including from um, people like you. And I just want you to know that um, you may underestimate your role in the recovery, but um, I remember right after the fires thinking, um, I live in the land of a thousand heroes. And I certainly counted you Margie as one of those. I just want you to know that. Thank you. And ours, you know, we thought our situation was terrible, but after Paradise, we felt fortunate almost that we didn't lose, or we still had our post office and our grocery store and our gas stations, and they lost so much. It's just heartbreaking, that community. Um, so our hearts go out to them still. Absolutely. I will say, you know, there's a Rebuild Paradise Foundation there um, that was stood up. Uh, I think I was there 12 days post-disaster, but they have this really awesome community hero who was a reusable grocery bag salesman. Mm -hmm. And he and his family made a lot of sacrifices so that he could stand up Rebuild Paradise Foundation. And to this day, um, he, that's, what he, that's what he does full time. And then he also shows up um, to help us help other communities because when they when we go into new communities and they're like well what do you want from us and I'm like well, I want to call you in a year you know mm -hmm. when this happens to somebody else and I want you to say here's what we did and see if this might help you adapt and that's why we started this podcast too is so that what I'm, I'm hoping is that somebody sees this and should a disaster befall their community or if one just has 
that they, you know, they, they realize that they too can margin foster. If they can use, you know, their social capital in order to make a big difference in their community, right. like you did for yours. Thank you. Well, thank you again for joining us on How to Disaster. My guest today has been Margie Foster, and she is a lesson in how to step up for your community and how important the role of the emergent leader is. And um, thank you again, Margie, for spending this time with us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.